probably looks pretty ancient, but um, it's actually surprisingly good. I'm sure that probably no one here has used it. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether this is still valid. I do remember that it's actually been recalibrated, I believe. Um, but essentially, what this instrument does here, that's got the light meter there, and as it goes down every uh, four times a second, it's taking a light reading and it knows the depth. And so what you're able to plot with that light meter will be something that looks like depth and light the symbol I, gives you all the surface, and there's some exponential decay of light, like so. And so when we plot our end of light, and its depth, we actually get this beautiful straight line, with the caveat that values at the surface are a little bit marginal at times, sometimes down to about half a metre or a metre, because of wave action and that sort of thing, so you've got to look carefully at readings um, in, in that region because it may not necessarily fit with that linear type pattern there. And the other thing is that um, the instrument actually bottoms out. Um, so if you have a, a light curve that looks like that, the, the, the readings down here uh, at the limits of the resolution of the instrument are therefore meaningless. So you actually end up working with sort of cut off here and cut off here. If you take these readings, you find that they're just gibberish, basically. So the first meter, does that count for a cloudy day, a bright day with clouds? Um, it's, uh, ideally, what you should be, you want constant light conditions as you drop your cast. Despite that, this is usually an R squared. the best you can when you're rocking down on the boat sometimes. But these, these instruments are, I mean, this light meter is just absolutely fantastic to do. That's another point I should have made actually. Um, if you are interested in your light profile, make sure you do the profile on the sunny side of the boat. I've seen a lot of casts that look like that because it doesn't get any light until it goes far enough under the boat. Good point. Thanks, Chris. Um, this does the same thing. Um, we probably need to just have a little look at it um, to make sure it's operating okay. And I would suggest that if someone's interested in the calibration of it, then um, they take it outside on a sunny day, an absolutely clear sunny day, and get a reading, say, at midday. And you can just look at the internet pretty much and find what the reading on a clear day at the given latitude at midday should be. Or work the calculations yourself, but it's pretty straightforward. So that's a, a useful check on the calibration of this. There are different calibrations for in air and underwater, so we need to be also a little bit careful about that. This one does upwelling and downwelling the radiance. So this one clearly points upwards so that the, it's the sun coming that way. This one is downwelling and gets the reflective radiation that comes back up, which is about 1% uh, the, the surface from what, what comes downwards. And if you want to get into that, this particular field, you can do a huge amount with upwelling and downwelling radiation because normally what you're able to do with the CTD is calculate the rate at which light decreases, known as the light attenuation coefficient. And so if that value is high, it means the water is very turbid and light decreases quickly. Um, with this one, uh, you could go a step further and calculate, according to Kirk, um, absorption coefficients, uh, scattering coefficients, and the total beam attenuation coefficient for light. And they are values that don't vary with the ambient light field. This KD value that you calculate here does have some slight sensitivity depending on, say, the day, time of day that you make the measurement. 
whereas these ones are supposed to be um, uh, have no dependence on the ambient light field. And so it's an interesting field, and Kirk's book is uh, called Light and Photosynthesis in Aquatic Systems. There are a couple of editions of that. It's a fascinating read because it links remote sensing to light measurements to um, a whole lot of very interesting photosynthesis aspects as, as well. Quite an amazing uh, read and amazing guy too that he virt virtually developed this whole optical field. He's only ever published on his own. Lives in Tasmania. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, recently wrote a book that's also almost worth a read, and it's to do with uh, skeptics and science, I think it's called. Or something like that. Mm. So if you're getting into this, uh, um, maybe uh, have a check with Warwick, and possibly myself, and we should just. Uh, Check out the calibration at some stage when we get the chance. So, what's been done? Yeah, I um, uh, chatted to uh, Colin Monk about the uh, calibration of this, and yeah, I think um, it does come down well. They've got a light bulb to um, calibrate terrestrial light core sensors, but for this one, he said uh, it would need some other calibration yeah. uh, method. So, um, just, just be careful about that. It will give you, of course, relative values right. which enable you to calculate the light attenuation coefficient. And typically, what we do is we'd um, go and go to the nearest um, airport or meteorological station there and get their 10 minute or hourly readings of, of radiation. And um, about 45% of the shortwave radiation is photosynthetically active. So you can now you can use that in combination your knowledge of the way that the light is attenuated through water to get basically your 10 minute radiation readings of the 